Greetings and welcome back everybody to another video. So way back in February 2019, I announced that I will be building a new PC. And finally, after months of waiting, I now have all the parts that I need to finish my Ryzen powered video editing and gaming workstation PC. And if you want to purchase any of these parts, all the links are down in the video description. And this will be an RGB build, so we've got RGB RAM, RGB CPU cooler, lots of RGB fans from Corsair, then the graphics card also has RGB lighting, and I will show you all the RGB lighting once we complete the build. Before that, this video is sponsored by, well, nobody. All the parts that you see have been bought with my own money, and nothing is sponsored here. Now before we begin, I want to make one thing clear. You can get better performance and value by cutting down on RGB lighting, especially the fans and buying a cheaper cabinet. You can also ditch the X570 board in favor of X470 if you don't need PCIe Gen 4. And obviously by going with 32GB of non-RGB RAM instead of 64GB RGB RAM. Then you can use the leftover money to buy a much, much powerful GPU. So with that out of the way, let us first start off by taking a look at the CPU. For this build, I have chosen the new AMD Ryzen 9 3900X. It is a 12 core, 24 thread desktop CPU built on the 7 nanometer manufacturing process node. That translates into power efficiency and better performance. Now this CPU was the biggest reason why my build has been delayed so much. It is out of stock everywhere online and offline retailers who do have this CPU in stock are selling this at a much higher price. So yeah, Ryzen 9 3900X is a hard to find desktop CPU at a reasonable price. Hmm, I wonder what will happen when AMD releases the 3950X. But anyway, for 2019 and early 2020, if you are building a high-end video editing workstation PC, this is the perfect choice. Now here's the thing, I would not recommend the Ryzen 9 CPU or the Core i9-9900K for gaming or streaming. Rather, save your money and go for the Ryzen 7 3700X or the Core i7-9700K or even Ryzen 5 and i5 will do just fine for gaming. And then you can use the leftover money for a higher tier GPU. But since my requirements is working on VMs, 4K video editing in Adobe Premiere and Photoshop, I have chosen the Ryzen 9 3900X. And also because of PCIe 4.0, so that means this CPU is a little bit more feature proof than the Core i9-9900K. Also you get the AMD's Wraith Prism RGB cooler, it's quite a decent cooler with nice RGB lighting. So here's a quick demo of the RGB LED lighting on the fan, just powering the AMD fan on an Intel PC. So yeah, the lights on this CPU cooler are gorgeous. And by the way, the lighting is addressable, so you do get two addressable cables. They just plug in into the cooler over here. One of them is USB and the other one goes into the RGB header on your motherboard. But I guess if you are building a PC that is this expensive, you won't be using the stock cooler anyway. But it's nice to know that AMD has got you covered if you don't want to buy a liquid cooler or an aftermarket air cooler. But yeah, take a look at that heatsink. That is massive. Take a look at those copper pipes and that copper cold plate. I think this heatsink is quite good enough if you're not overclocking and for general day-to-day -day use. But I would still recommend if you're buying the Ryzen 9 3900X or above, go with liquid AIO cooling or do a custom liquid cooling loop. Now the CPU cooler I'm going to go with is the Corsair's H150i Pro RGB AIO liquid cooler. It features a 360mm radiator and the pump block also has RGB lighting. And this should be more than sufficient to keep the Ryzen 9 running nice and cool under heavy load. It also comes with 3 non-RGB fans but I've got that covered. I will be replacing these fans with Corsair's Light Loop 120mm fans because you know, RGB will definitely help us achieve that 10 GHz mark. Moving on to the motherboard, I have picked out the MSI MEG X570 Ace. Yes, I've gone with X570 rather than X470. If you are buying the Ryzen 3000, just go with X570, it's a much better choice and you also get PCIe Gen 4. Now this is an ATX form factor board and it has all the standard features that you would expect from a high-end X570 board. We have 3 M.2 slots, 4 RAM slots and this board supports up to 128GB of RAM with up to 4600 megahertz in OC mode. Then you also have RGB lighting on top of the IO shield, onboard Intel Wi-Fi 6 AX200 and yes the motherboard does have onboard Bluetooth. Dual LAN ports, one of them is 2.5 gigabits. Coming to the VRMs we have a 12 plus 2 plus 1 design 
that is plenty of power for the 12 core Ryzen 9 3900X. The VRM is cooled by that large heatsink and it also has a heat pipe that runs from the VRM heatsink down to the chipset fan. Speaking of the chipset fan, this motherboard has a slightly larger fan than what you would see on X570 ports. Typically you have those blower style fans but this one looks like a regular Axial fan. And the best part is it's got zero RPM mode. I think MSI calls this zero frozer. Now what happens is the fan stops running when the temperatures aren't high. And that should extend the life of the fan since it is not running 24 seven. You also have the power on and reset buttons on the board. Then this is the MSI's game booster knob for on the go overclocking, but I don't recommend that you use this. And lastly, we also have an LED debug display. And I think this will show you the CPU temperature once the system has started up. This board also has a built-in backplate with red and black theme. And starting from the left, we have the flash BIOS and clear CMOS button, then two Wi-Fi antenna connectors, a PS2 port if you want to go old school with a mechanical keyboard. Then we have a total of seven USB type A ports and one USB type C, out of which two are USB 2.0. So there are two USB 3.0 Gen 1 ports and the red highlighted ones are USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports out of which one of them is USB Type-C. There are two LAN ports out of which one is 2.5 gigabit. Then coming to the audio we have the standard connectors and a SPDIF out. By the way the audio on this motherboard is powered by the ALC1220. You know what, at this price point what MSI could have done is that they could have added two more USB ports instead of the PS2 port. But I think for most people, 8 USB ports should also be sufficient. Now since this isn't a motherboard review, I'm gonna skip rest of the features because I can just go on talking about this board. Anyway, what I don't like about this board is the fact that it's only got 4 SATA ports. But it should not be a problem for most people unless you are planning on building a storage server then this board is not for you. For me, this is not a problem because the case that I'm going to use only has four hard drive bays. But I do like the black and gold theme of this motherboard and the armor style heat sinks. And here is a quick look at the back of the motherboard. And yes, this board does support Nvidia SLI and AMD Crossfire. So let me quickly show you what all accessories we get with the motherboard. So we have three M.2 screws, four SATA cables, two of these are right angle cables, then we have the Wi-Fi antenna and these are all your RGB cables. Then we have the case badge and all of this comes in this black bag. Coming to the RAM, I have bought two 32GB kits of G-Skill Trident Z Neo RGB RAM. DDR4 obviously, don't think I need to mention that. This is running at 3600MHz and these are optimized for the 3rd gen AMD Ryzen platform. Now you don't need 64GB of RAM for 4K video editing and even multitasking. 32GB should be more than enough for a power user. But the thing is, I got the second kit on a huge discount and I just could not resist purchasing it. Initially I was going to go with Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro but the huge discount on the second kit had me sold on G-Scale. So these are two reasons why I went for G-Scale and 64GB of RAM. Anyway, these should overclock nicely, they do have a nice heatsink covering them and the RGB LEDs on this should also be really nice. Now for the GPU, I've picked up the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2070 and this one is from MSI Gaming Z series and I've done a full review on this card way back in February 2019 so if you want to see a review of this card including the RGB LED lighting, you might want to check out that video. Also, the MSI Gaming Z card has this zero RPM fan mode, so when the GPU is sitting idle, the fan will not spin at all. Now, the choice of the video card is quite questionable. Ideally, with the Ryzen 9 3900X, you would want to go with the fastest GPU available to avoid any bottlenecks in games. But the thing is, I don't need the fastest and the most powerful GPU because my primary purpose here is to edit 4K videos, but I do occasionally game when I get time. And secondly, I don't have a 4K monitor yet, although I will be upgrading to a 4K display very soon. So yeah, for casual occasional gaming, even in 4K, this GPU is perfect. But hey, if you don't like my choice, feel free to donate an RTX 2080 Ti rather than crying about it in the comments. For my boot drive, I've got a 500GB WD Black NVMe SN750 SSD. Now this is temporary, after a month or so, I will be buying a PCIe Gen 4 NVMe very soon, 
possibly a one terabyte drive and I will use that as my scratch disk for Adobe Premiere and a regular one terabyte SSD for my Windows boot drive. But for now to get the system up and running this will be perfect. And for large storage I've got two 4 terabyte WD Blue hard drives. I guess what I'm going to do is I'm gonna dump all my Steam games and my personal files onto one hard drive and the other one to store all my finished 4K videos. So this should be plenty of storage for now. And lastly, powering all the components is the Corsair RM1000X. This is an 80 plus gold fully modular power supply and the best part is this is semi-passive. So the fan will not run until the power supply is at least under 40% load and that comes out to be about 400 watts and even when the fan runs it is very silent. So you guys see where I'm going with this right? I am aiming for a completely silent computer at least when it's idle or when it's under little load. I really don't want any fan noise coming from this PC especially when I'm recording a video. Now PC Part Picker reported an average total power consumption of about 500 watts. So 1 kilowatt power supply is a complete overkill. But once again, I kinda got this power supply on a huge discount so why pick a 750 watt power supply when you can pick up a 1 kilowatt, 80 plus gold fully modular power supply for the same price. And this power supply is heavy. It's very difficult to lift this thing up with one hand. By the way, that main filter cap is from Nichicon and those small capacitors down there are from Nippon Chemicon. So full Japanese capacitors on this power supply and this thing screams quality. And all of this powerful hardware is going to live inside the Corsair Crystal 570X tempered glass case. I absolutely adore the Crystal 570X from Corsair, although this is a slightly dated case. The newer ones are yet to arrive in my country, so I just picked up the Crystal 570X. This one has four tempered glass panels, so you can show off your sweet RGB lighting and hardware. Now speaking of RGB, there are already three Corsair SP120 fans installed. These are very basic and don't have addressable RGB lighting. So I will be replacing these with Corsair's LL120s. So I've got two packs of Corsair's LL120s. Three of them will go in the front where the 360mm radiator goes. Two of them will go on the top and one of them will go at the back. On the top of the Crystal 570X, we have two USB 3.0 ports. Then we have a microphone jack, headphone jack, then three buttons to control the lightings on the SP120 fans. Now these three buttons will become redundant because we will be installing the Lighting Node Pro and removing the pre-installed SP120 controller. Then we have the power button. I really wish this case had a USB-C port on the top because the motherboard we are using has a USB-C out for the front of the case. The other side also has a tempered glass panel and it looks like there is little room for cable management. Now cable management will be quite important because we have a glass panel so everything will be visible. Anyways for the hard drives we have two 3.5 inch and two 2.5 inch hard drive base and there is Corsair's RGB fan hub already installed. I will be keeping that but I will remove the SP120 controller it will give me more room for cable management and we don't really need the SP120 controller because I will be replacing the SP120 fans with LL120s. And the 570X also comes with magnetic dust filters on the front and on the top but I still think this will be a monthly job for me to clean out all the dust that will accumulate on the underside of the glass. Because when the fans are running, they will pull all the air and the dust inside. But yeah, that remains to be seen. Okay, so let us go ahead and start building. So before we mount the motherboard inside the case, the first thing we want to do is install the RAM, install the CPU and install the M.2 SSD. I'm going to start off by installing the M.2 SSD. So I'm going to be installing this in the first slot. This is the slot that is directly connected to the CPU. All right, so we will start by unscrewing this. Now grab your M.2 SSD and align the key with the notch on the slot. So it should go in like this. Push it in and that is it. And now you can screw in the M.2 SSD over here. And that is it, the M.2 SSD is now installed. Now this particular motherboard has this heat sink for the M.2 SSD. So what we wanna do here is peel this plastic thingy off. 
this is very important the manual says you must peel this little plastic layer off and then install this heat sink because this is the thermal pad on the heat sink so we will just go ahead and install this and once you have placed the heat sink on top of the M.2 drive just gently squeeze this into place and then screw it in and that is it our M.2 SSD is now installed with the heatsink. So now we will install the CPU. So just remove this retaining bracket. Now what you want to do is make note of that little arrow over there. And our arrow on the motherboard is over here. So the CPU will install like this. Just gently place it on top of the slot and it should automatically pop in. And once it does, just close this retaining bracket. And there you have it. And by the way, this is my first AMD CPU installation. I have built countless Intel PCs, but this is my first AMD machine. Now the final step is installing the RAM. Now before you install the RAM, make sure that you open up these retaining clips. And now we can go ahead and install the RAM. So now grab a stick of RAM and just insert it into the slot. Just make sure that this thing aligns up properly otherwise you might end up damaging your RAM. So make sure that you align that little notch and then all you have to do is gently press the RAM in place and these brackets should close up automatically. And that is it, our RAM, CPU and M.2 SSD is now installed. Now we can go ahead and install the motherboard into the case. Okay, so you guys can see I have taken out all the glass panels from the case so that nothing breaks. And for ease of installation, you might want to put the case sideways like this. And now we are going to install the motherboard. So the motherboard is now properly installed. All the standoffs were pre-installed on this case. And these are the screws for the motherboard. Now you must take this plastic off the IO shield otherwise it will not fit properly. So yeah I kind of made this mistake forgot to take this thing out. So make sure you take out this plastic thingy from the IO shield otherwise the motherboard will not sit properly. And now I'm going to screw in the motherboard with the provided screws. And these screws come with the case. So I have tightened down all the screws and the motherboard is now safely in place. And what you want to do is take the remaining screws and store it in this plastic bag that comes with the case and you want to keep this at a safe location. Now since we are going to remove the pre-installed SP120 fans, what I'm going to do next is take off this shroud. Uh, this is the cable management shroud. So these are the thumb screws. I will just take these out and then unplug all the wires from the fan hub and then remove the fans. So I have removed the cable management shroud and it covers up all these cables and these are the wires that are coming from the fans. So now we'll go ahead and remove the pre-installed SP120 fans. So we're going to take a quick look at the LL120 fans and the hardware that is supplied with the fans. So this is the three pack version. You also get this in single pack. So inside the box you get the three fans and the accessory kit. Now this kit contains everything that you need. It has the Corsair Lighting Note Pro and it also has an RGB fan hub. And obviously all the mounting hardware so you do get screws. And this is the Corsair Lighting Note Pro. This connects to your computer through USB. So it's got a USB port over there. And here is the internal USB cable. This will plug in into your motherboard. And this one goes into the Lighting Node Pro. And this is the three pin cable that will go from the Lighting Node Pro to the Fan Hub. And Fan Hub can address up to six fans. So this is where three pin cable plugs in. And again, this one also has SATA power connector. 
and the Lighting Note Pro also has a SATA power connector. And this one also comes with double sided mounting pads. So does the fan hub. Now fan hub is already pre-installed on our case so I will not be needing this but we are going to install the Lighting Note Pro. So instead of the SP Lighting Controller we will be installing the Lighting Note Pro. So this one is compatible with LL120s and Corsair's RGB LED strip. Now here's the fun part, if you are just installing 6 LL120 fans, you don't actually need to install the Corsair Lighting Note Pro. The MSI MEG X570 Ace already has a Corsair RGB header over here. So all you need to do is run a cable from this 3 pin Corsair header on the motherboard into the Corsair fan hub which is supplied with the fans. So this is fantastic, you don't even need to install the Lighting Note Pro. But here's the thing, since I'm also installing these Corsair RGB LED light strips, I will need the Lighting Note Pro because this has two channels. So the first channel will go to the fan hub and the second channel I will use to power these LED strips. But yeah, it's good to know that there is a Corsair header on the motherboard. By the way, the 3 pin cable that connects over here to the RGB controller is supplied with the motherboard. So now we can go ahead and remove the pre-installed SP120 fans. By the way, these are mounted on a frame. So there are two thumb screws here. So one thumb screw is over here on the top and the other one is there at the bottom. So all you do is take these thumb screws out and the fans will come right out and you can see they are kind of installed on a frame. So now we will install the new fans onto the radiator and then we will install this bracket. So this is one single step. Uh, you cannot install the fans first on the bracket and then install them on the radiator. It will just not work. The fans go on the radiator like this, align them properly. Then you can install the frame. And after that, we will use these long screws to secure the fans in place. So all you have to do is align all the fans properly with these screw holes onto the radiator okay so all the fans are now properly mounted and i had to do this off camera because i really don't want to puncture the radiator so when you are screwing these uh, fans onto the radiator you kind of have to be careful not to screw in uh, anywhere else other than that screw hole on the radiator and while you are doing this make sure that all of your fan cables are on the opposite side and not on the side which will be visible to the user so inside the case this side of the radiator will be visible to the user so the part of the frame which has these grooves this side will be visible so you don't want the fan cables sticking out from over here rather you want them to be on the other side so that the cables are not visible to us so before i install the radiator and the fans in the case it is important that i label all the rgb cables so this fan is number one two three this is very important because the Lighting hub will address these as 1, 2 and 3 and 4, 5 and 6 are our other case fans that we are yet to install. So the bottom fan is number 1. So I have already labeled the RGB cable. This will plug into the number 1 port on the fan hub and this is our number 2 middle fan and number 3 is our topmost fan. So the effect on the case will go from bottom to top and then on the top of the case it will travel back and then finally it will terminate on the rear of the case. I will demonstrate all of this when we put the case back together. Alright so I have installed the fans on the top of the case and on the rear of the case. Now do take note of the position. These fans will suck in cool air from outside and then blow it inside the system. Ideally I would not recommend this, ideally I would recommend that you have these fans installed upside down so that they suck hot air out of your computer and blow it out from the top. You do imagine the radiator will be pulling in cold air from outside and once it passes through the radiator that air will heat up and all that heat will accumulate inside your PC and you want these fans to blow all that heat outside. The only reason why I have these fans installed upside down is because of that RGB LED. So these are just for aesthetic purposes. Ideally, I would recommend that you install these fans so that they are sucking in hot air from inside your case and blowing it outside. The only fan that will be blowing air outside is this rear fan and the power supply fan. 
So yeah, we will see how the thermals are like on this computer. Shouldn't be too bad, but yeah, let's see what happens. So now I'm going to install the radiator and the pump block on the CPU. The radiator and the front fans are now installed. Take a look. It really, really looks nice. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is install the pump block. Okay, so installing the AM4 CPU block does require a little bit more work because you will need to take the Intel mounting hardware out. So just rotate and take the Intel mounting hardware out and we will now install the AM4 mounting hardware which is this one. So you just align this and it clips into place. Then you have these two screws. These are two thumb screws and these two latches that we need to install on this mounting plate. Man, the autofocus of this camera is bad. But here is the latch, just insert, and then just mount the thumb screw. And you don't have to tighten it all the way. We will tighten it once we install the CPU block onto the Ryzen CPU. So that is it. Leave a little bit of play in this, and we are going to do the same on the other side. So you guys can see our mounting hardware for AM4 CPU is now ready. So I will now gently reposition this pump block. So one latch is in place and now gotta be a little bit careful. And that is it, you hear that click and now the CPU block is properly installed and now we can go ahead and tighten these thumb screws up. So the CPU block has a few cables. This one has four pins and these ones will connect the front fans. So I will just snake this cable off at the back of the motherboard. There's a little slot over here. And this is the pump tachometer cable. This will plug in into our CPU fan header, just like that. And this is the SATA power for the pump. This one also I will route so that it's not really visible. So yeah, there's a space over there. Let me just do this and I'll be right back. So you guys can see I have done some work off camera. A lot of cables are now connected. So let me just quickly walk you through. So the front audio cable is connected over here. The Lighting Node Pro is connected over here and this is the pump block. Yes, the pump block does have a USB over here. So it's going at the back and coming out from over here and it's connected to the internal USB ports. And I've also connected the two four terabyte hard drive so these are our SATA cables front USB 3 and this is our 24 pin power cable and I've also connected these system fans so these three are these fans two at the top and one at the back and I've also connected the CPU cable or the EPS cable it's over here you don't need to connect the second one these two slots are just wired up together one CPU cable is more than sufficient you don't need to connect both of these EPS cables so check this out guys, I am now installing these LED light strips from Crosshair and these are actually magnetic so these will stick automatically to your case. And you can see they are already installed. So on the side, on the top, uh, you can't really see it can ya? So there's one light strip on the top and one over here. And I'll put one at the bottom. Now I'm going to install the power supply and the last thing we'll do is install the GPU. But take a look at this mess over here. Wow, that will take some serious cable management to clear out. So I have installed the power supply with the fan facing up. You can also install the power supply with the fan facing down. There is a dust filter at the bottom of the case, but I do prefer having the power supply on the top like this. Number one, there's going to be nice airflow because I have installed the top fans to blow air into the cabinet. And the front fans also will be blowing air inside the cabinet. So the air can easily exit through the power supply. And when the fans are not running, this power supply is a passive one. So once the power supply gets warm, all the hot air will rise and it will exit over here and the rear fan can suck it out. So that is why I have installed the power supply with the fan facing on the top. So now I will install the GPU and turn the computer on and we will see if it posts or not. Oh yeah, before I install the graphics card, I'm gonna take this sticker off. And also I'm gonna take this one and this sticker off. And I have already taken the sticker off from the top slot. Finally, the GPU is now installed and I think the finished product looks quite good. 
and still have to tidy up the cables at the back but I think on the front it does look good. The GPU does sag a little bit so I might have to put that bracket down there but all said and done does look nice. So let me just connect the power and the monitor up and we will see if the system posts. Okay, moment of truth. Let's see if this computer starts up. So I have connected the HDMI cable and the power cable and that is it. No keyboard and mouse and we shall see if there is any display. So I'm gonna hit the power button, show you guys the RGB LED lighting. So it does start up. Let's see if we get any display. But man, look at that RGB lighting. Looks awesome. Still no display. I think it will be showing a postcode over there. And we do have something. Yes, we have display. And this is the message that we want to see. Reboot and select proper boot device. Insert boot media and select device and press a key. So yes, this computer does start up, no problem. I've tried doing some cable management and it's really not the best kind of cable management in the world. Now I do have some complaints. Uh, particularly this motherboard cable, the CPU power cable, this is not long enough. I would have preferred this cable to go from the side of the case down here and back into the power supply. But this is not long enough so I had to route it from over here between the two hard drive cages. And I put some zip ties over here so that these cables do not keep on flapping around. And this is our power cable for the pump. Again, this is short. Uh, I would have again preferred this if it was uh, running on the edges. Just becomes easier to hide the cables. And the same goes for these RGB and the USB cables. These are just not long enough. And speaking of RGB, the Lighting Node Pro is inside over here. I was going to put it on the power supply right over here, but I decided that I should like tuck it inside over here. Uh, because if I put it over here, there are three extra cables running uh, like this so I just thought I'll just put it inside over here and put some zip ties over here uh, there's a zip tie here I've zip tied the RGB wires coming from the front fans and you guys can see I've also added another hard drive so a total of three hard drives I've installed this because this one has all my files in it and uh, all the RGB cables are connected unfortunately I was not able to hide the 24 pin power connector for the motherboard this cable is just too thick and it just won't fit inside over here. So it's coming out from over here and it's running down in the power supply. And taking a look over here, these are our fan cables. So the front fan cables are coming out from the top. The RGB cables for the front fans are coming out from the bottom just because it's uh, near the Corsair fan hub. So these are connected to the pump block. The wire from the pump block is this one, this flat ribbon cable. So yeah, not the best cable management in the world, but I think this will do just fine. And take a look at that. The glass panel fits, no problem. Although I did have to bend this SATA power cable, otherwise the glass was not sitting flush on this side. So I just had to bend that cable a little bit and now the glass panel fits, no problem. You can barely see the cable mess down there, but yeah. So let us run Cinebench R20 and see how our scores are like. But before that, let me tell you I have turned on Precision Boost Overdrive in Ryzen Master. I've closed down all the background applications. Then the memory is also running at 3600 MHz. And other than this, I have not touched any settings on the computer. So all of the other stuff is stuck. And I did run Cinebench before. It gave me a score of 7037. So let's run Cinebench right now and see what kind of scores we get. Okay, let's go. quite fast isn't it it's quite a huge improvement over 3770 see how the temperatures are like so it's reading almost 80 degrees and this is completely normal for Ryzen 9 3900X and we are almost done check the temperature 
temperatures. Yeah, so we are picking about 79 to 80 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's what I got before. Okay, so here are our scores. I got a score of 7,129. So that is all right, a little bit higher than before. I did not close the background applications when I was running this before. So now after closing all the background apps, we got a score of 7,129. Oops, forgot to take this plastic thingy off. So here we go, much better. Oh yeah, it does look good without that plastic thingy on the glass. Now I was thinking of sticking one of these stickers on the glass, but I've decided I'm not gonna do that because that will spoil the seamless looks of this PC. I also thought of sticking the case badge on the front, but yeah, I'm just gonna keep the original looks of this case without any stickers. But these stickers are really nice. This is the Ryzen 9 sticker that came with the processor. Then this is powered by Corsair, this came with the power supply, by the way this is a metallic sticker. And this is the sticker that came with the RAM, G scale, I have two of these. And this one came with the motherboard. Unfortunately this is not metallic but it's yeah, still a nice sticker. But anyway I won't be sticking any stickers on this case, I do prefer having the seamless looks of the glass. Now coming to the RGB lighting, I must say I am impressed by the Corsair LL120 fans and these Corsair LED light strips. Look at how the lighting effect starts from the bottom fan and then travels to the rear fan and it looks like the LED light strips are also in sync with the fans. Notice how the effect travels together on the fans and on the light strips. That is really cool and epic, I love the synchronization between the two. And this is one reason why we plugged in the fans into the RGB hub in a proper sequence. And since all the LEDs are individually addressable, there are tons of effect available in the Corsair's IQ software. There is also a brightness control if you wish to turn the brightness down and if you wish you can also turn the lights off completely for a good night's sleep. The G-Skill RAM also has its own piece of software and that also has its own lighting effects and the LEDs on the RAM are also individually addressable and that kind of allows you to set your own custom color if you wish to do so. But I am quite happy with the pre-installed effects on the Corsair IQ software and on the G-Skill software. And I'm running Shadow of the Tomb Raider over here and if you guys remember this is the scene where the i7-3770 was maxing out at 100% and take a look at the CPU usage. It's about 35 to 40% on the Ryzen 9 and it's running at 4.1 to 4.2 gigahertz. Actually the bottleneck over here is our GPU and by the way the game is running at 1080p. All the settings are maxed out including ray tracing. Now the temperatures also look quite good. Obviously they will be good because the case is open right now but the CPU is running at 61 degrees Celsius. Occasionally it will jump to 69 and it's running at 4.2 gigahertz then the gpu is running at 67 degrees it also jumps up to 69 degrees celsius and do keep in mind that the radiator fans are running at the lowest possible speed and the pump is also running in quiet mode so these temperatures are actually quite okay i've done prime 95 test on this pc and everything is rock solid stable and the ambient temperature in the room is 26.8 degrees celsius and you guys know I have built this computer keeping silence in mind. So right now we are running a game and the fans are set to the lowest speed possible. Uh, let's take a look at the noise levels. I'm just gonna keep quiet.
So I guess we are averaging somewhere around 28 decibels that is quite acceptable within range and I think that's the background noise levels in my room. So this thing is actually very very silent and when the glass is on the cabinet it will become even more silent. You know I want to take a look at that chipset fan so just let me grab my light here. Okay let's take a look at that chipset fan. So the chipset fan is actually not running. Take a look at that. The GPU fan is running though, you can see it over there. And the 7 segment LED display is giving us a readout of the CPU temperature. But it's very hard to see that LED display. I wish MSI had put it somewhere over there on top. And overall I'm quite satisfied with the noise levels and the thermals of this PC. And looks like the power supply fan is running. It's running at a very very low RPM and with the glass panels on with the lowest fan speed and the lowest pump speed the CPU temperature is more or less the same it's still at 64 degrees it touches 70 degrees occasionally but the GPU temperature has gone up so it's averaging around 75 degrees Celsius but the thing is the computer is quiet it does blow out a lot of hot air from the back you can feel the air coming out over here so a lot of you guys might want to know how the temperatures are like when the computer is idle so right now i'm just streaming a 4k 60 fps video on youtube this is from gamers nexus and all of the fans are running at the lowest speed possible so quiet mode around 800 rpm the pump is also set to the quiet mode and that makes the pump run at the lowest rpm and it looks like this CPU is idling around 43 degrees Celsius and this is running stock so I haven't touched the voltages in the motherboard and we can confirm that uh, from the temperature readout on the motherboard it's right over there so the processor is running at 42 degrees Celsius with a 360 AIO and I honestly think that is a little bit warm considering it's a big 360 AIO and by the way the ambient room temperature right now is 25.5 degrees celsius and i also put the glass panel back on so glass panel a dust filter then you have the fans and then the radiator and when i was running prime 95 the cpu maxed out at 80 degrees celsius and that is with the pump speed set to 3000 rpm and the fans were running at 1600 rpm so yeah the ryzen 9 3900x does get quite warm but I might tweak some voltages in the motherboard and then get back to you guys maybe in another video. Now onto some gaming numbers. Before that let me also tell you that I have given the GPU plus 90MHz on the core clock and plus 75MHz on the memory clock and the power limit is set to 111. And we are running the latest driver which is 441.20 and this is the latest at the time of recording this video. And I've also set the CPU to run with the Precision Boost Overdrive in Ryzen Master and all of the other settings are set to default. The fans are running at their lowest speed possible and the pump is set to quiet. Okay, since I already have Shadow of the Tomb Raider running, let's do a quick benchmark. And you guys can see the game is maxed out at 1080p with ultra ray tracing quality and the game works flawlessly on this configuration. And this is one of the most complex scenes in the game with the CPU usage hovering barely over 33%. It is our graphics card that is the bottleneck over here. I told you guys with the Ryzen 9 3900X if you can afford it go with the RTX 2080 Ti. Alright Shadow of the Tomb Raider running on the Ryzen 9 3900X with the RTX 2070 gives us an average frame rate of 88 with a minimum of 52 and 1% lows is at 58 and 0.1% low at 13. The next game we are going to run is Metro Exodus. This is also maxed out on all the settings including ray tracing and this game also works flawlessly on this configuration. You can also run this game at 4K with this graphics card but this 2070 is really for 1440p gaming. But you can run this game at 4K although you will have to drop some settings. The frame rate was always above 60 FPS so no problems. So Metro Exodus maxed out with ray tracing averages around 87 FPS. 1% low is at 64 and 0.1% low is at 51. And I really like how the fan lights and the LED strips are in sync with the game. For example when you get injured like I did over here. 
all the lights have turned red and this is automatic i haven't touched any settings in the game or in the corsair iq rise of the tomb raider is also running maxed out and this game also averages above 60 fps everything maxed out although with anti-aliasing enabled this game is quite gpu intensive Anyway, we get an average of 64 FPS with a minimum of 44, 1% low is at 45 and 0.1% low is at 40. Next up is Battlefield 5 and you guys can see everything is maxed out including DXR which is DirectX Ray Tracing. Although I did experience a little stuttering when I was playing this game, that happened 3 times and that kind of dropped my 0.1% lows. I have been searching why this happens on Reddit and it seems like this is a common issue with this game so I really can't help it. But overall the game does work fine on this configuration with an average frame rate of 80 with a minimum of 50. The 1% low was at 24 and 0.1% low was 4 FPS thanks to the stuttering. Coming to Dota 2, this game will happily run at 200 FPS, everything maxed out. You can easily play this game at 4K without stressing out the GPU and the CPU. The last game I am going to run is Apex Legends and this is also completely maxed out and it ran super smooth. There was no stuttering like there was at Battlefield 5 and I am a complete noob at this game. This is maybe the 4th or 5th time I've actually played this but anyways this is a fun game to play and the RTX 2070 should handle this game just fine even in 4K. Shouldn't be a problem. Gaming is not really limited by the CPU here, it's the GPU that is the bottleneck with the Ryzen 9 3900X. The 3900X has a lot of power. Looks like we have an average frame rate of 140 and a minimum of 93 with 1% lows at 95 and 0.1% lows at 52. So that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you guys have enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed building this PC. And with such a powerful CPU and plenty of RAM, this configuration will be good for at least 5-6 to six years. Just like my old i7-3770, it is still going strong even though the CPU is from 2012. So that is one advantage of building a PC with a powerful CPU. The only upgrade that you will need in the near future is the graphics card. But the 2070 should be good for at least 2 years. I am guessing Nvidia will come out with 3000 series cards next year which is 2020. And from my personal experience after building this full RGB PC, going all out on addressable RGB especially Corsair stuff does cost quite a bit of extra money and after spending so much on RGB lighting I would personally recommend that you skip on RGB lighting completely and go with all black look on your system and use the leftover money to invest in a much more powerful graphics card. And as for Adobe Premiere, I will install it only after I buy a 1TB PCIe Gen 4 NVMe and I will be using that as my scratch disk. So that will come next month. Until then, I will use this PC as it is. Okay, so that is about it guys. Thank you for watching and I will see you guys next time.